Seventh-day Adventist, raised as a, a, a New York Jewish boy. He became an Adventist in this church where I gave Bible studies, and right off the bat, he and I started going out and giving Bible studies. So I figured it would help him get up to speed on Adventism, and we did that for a long time. So, I mean, I don't know how many years he and I have been involved with teaching this message, but it's many years. And um, I often wondered when we first got involved with this message, and there's another brother. You remember Tony and Michelle? Well, Tony came to a camp meeting that we had in California here recently, in the past year or so in Camp Cedar Falls. And he also lived in the same town that Brother Glenn and I lived in. And I remember that when we first started studying these things, that one of the people that we were studying with was this brother named Tony. So I finally had a way to figure out when we first started studying these things, because Brother Tony got married in our backyard. And I hope you're not recording this. This is just allowing people to come in, all right? And so Tony was there. I, said, I could ask him, hey, when was it that you got married to Michelle? So that gave us a point of reference when we started studying these things because we were having Bible studies at that time. It was 1989 that he got married, which is a long time to be in this message. And when you're in this message, we you've... We were studying at 1985 with four or five nights a week studies with other people. Oh, yeah, I wasn't denying that. All I, I, I knew that I had a... I can say that we were already doing stuff in 1989. But if you were really to stand on 85, fine. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that, that's another point along the way. That's when the, the understanding of this last six verses of Daniel 11 first began. But in the, the 80s, the first thing we were discovering and teaching was this prophetic line, the 3-1 combination. That comes from Selected Messages, Book 2, 104. To 106, I believe, and that's where we were starting to see things. But in any case, when you've been playing with these truths in these type of environments for a long time, I was talking to a sister here just a minute ago, and I, and I realized when I was talking to her that I've told this story a few times here this Sabbath, but I've told it many, many times, so I don't know if it benefits anyone, but I'll tell you what I told her. I'm positive of this. When you first start studying this message, you determine, okay, I'm going to test this out. And then you get to the point, oh, there's enough light in this that I'm going to, I'm going to understand it. Then there's kind of a frustration or a discouragement because you, it, it's just too much. You can't, you can't get it. But my experience is, and this is what I tell people, there's a learning curve. You trudge along, you trudge along here, and then a light comes on and you go up to another level real fast. And, and from what I understand, that's, that's how the worldly people will tell you that you, you learn anything. There's a learning curve, you get to a certain plateau, and then lights click on. But I'm convinced that it's not simply worldly learning curve that is defining this, that, that the Lord prevents us from understanding this immediately because He is He's... He's testing us to see if we're really willing to consecrate ourselves to the work of eating and internalizing His Word. And if we are of the, those that give up before we finish that initial work, then we don't get the blessing of having Him lift us to that next plateau. And I will tell you also that there's more than one plateau. Once you get to the point where you can understand this thing at a pretty surface level, there's, there's, either, there's still things that, lights that the Lord is going to turn on for you if you hang in there. So what I'm saying is, hang in there if you're hearing this for the first time. But it's not just about learning the child's own vision about the prophetic events. If you're truly going to come to understand this, it's only going to be because the line of the tribe of Judah is placing his seal of approval upon your consecration to learn this and determine that he's going to give you the blessing of the understanding that you need to get to these levels of understanding. Um, anyway, everyone seems to be in. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? Heavenly 
Heavenly Father, we know that in Sister White's first vision that we were portrayed on a path going upward to the earth made new, to heaven, and that there was a light behind us and that Jesus was before us and that there was a a testing that was going on in that history and that those that would deny the midnight cry, the light behind them, that they would fall to that wicked world below. And it's no doubt this experience that is part of the sign and crying that is portrayed in Ezekiel 9, that only those that understand the significance, the seriousness, and the heartbreak of watching a brother or sister or a family member fall off this path that can truly fulfill and express the anxiety of those that are sealed in Ezekiel chapter 9. But nevertheless, we want you to finish this work. We want to go home with you. Uh, We want to focus on the glorious light that's coming from Jesus' right arm on the path ahead of us and continue to appreciate the light behind us and keep moving forward, even though we know that we're going to have to surrender all our belongings before we finish this path. We ask that this weekend, this study can be a part of the work that you've done for us to accomplish this work in us. And as we take up this final presentation, we once again ask that you would overrule any thoughts, human thoughts that I might have and take control of the presentation, that it might be from the throne room on high and it might enter into our hearts and minds and perfect our characters more fully and prepare us with a message that is more winning, more thorough. We pray that you would continue to bind off this meeting now and that the entire Sabbath studies would be a complete package, a complete understanding. I pray that you would bring conviction upon the hearts and minds here to go home and test these things, um, if they are true, to make them their own understanding. And I thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm on page 22 of our notes. The scripture which above all others had been both the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel 8.14 We're going to take up the fourth part of the 2300 days that we're considering here, which is the one week where Christ confirms his covenant. And in Leviticus 26, verse 25, which is our point of reference for these studies, chapters 25 and 26 of Leviticus, he says, I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilences among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of of the enemy. We're to reason from cause to effect, and the reason of, for the curse of Leviticus 26, the curse of the seven times, the curse of the 2520, is the quarrel of his covenant. And in Daniel 9.27, Christ comes to confirm the covenant with many for one week. Daniel 9.27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now, this word week is the Strong's 7620, and it's properly a passive participle of 7650. And 7650 is a denominative, which I did not define earlier today, of 7651. And 7651 is the word that is translated as seventh in the Sabbath commandment and in the seventh year in Leviticus Um, Leviticus statutes of the land resting the seventh year. It's the same word, except this is a passive participle. Anyone know what a passive participle is? It's identifying past tense. Okay, this is the same word, brothers and sisters, that is translated as seven times in Leviticus 26. All right. It's the same word that is translated four times in Leviticus 25, verse 8, as seven when it's describing the 49-year cycle that leads to the Jubilee. 
Okay, it's the same word that is translated as oath in Daniel 9.11. Okay. So this here, this week, is a, the passive participle of this word, meaning past tense, I really like this. The grammar is accurate. Here, Daniel's talking about a future event to his day and age that takes place from 27 AD to 34 AD. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week for 2,520 days. But it's a passive participle of this work, of this word that's translated as seven times in Leviticus 26, meaning it's past tense. But this prophecy here, when Daniel sets it forth in Daniel 9, it, 9, it is future to his day and age. But when he says week here twice, it's a passive participle, meaning past tense. Why does Daniel portray this week that is still future to him in the past tense? You follow me? I like this because it's grammatically correct. <laughs> All right. And um, why does he do that? And uh, Revelation 13.8 tells us why he does this. Everyone probably already knows why he does this, right? I heard some mm-hmms. Revelation 13.8 And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from when? The foundation of the world. So when he comes to confirm the many with covenant with many for one week, this week that is the same word as seven times, Daniel puts in the past tense because he knows the focus where the covenant is confirmed in this week is the cross. And even though the cross was still future to Daniel's day and age, it took place at the foundation of the world. So I hope you see that when we're dealing with this word that is a symbolic word, it's translated as seventh, it's both an ordinal and a cardinal. It ha it's a type of a Sabbath, and the Sabbaths are signs, which means they're symbolic. The Sabbaths are symbolic in their actual application, and they're symbolic at the grammatical level in the scriptures, and here in Daniel 9.27, the grammar is even being technically accurate to the prophecy as well. So the, the Hebrew words, the grammar of the Hebrew words is in complete agreement with the prophetic testimony. I think this is important to see. That, the, that, that these words aren't being wrested out of some meaning to fit some deluded idea here at the end of the world. Okay, go to Daniel 9.2. For some reason, I thought we had already put this in place, but I haven't. When I say we have put it in place, if it didn't get put in place, it wasn't you, it was me. Go to Daniel 9.2. We'll build upon this grammatical argument a little bit. Daniel 9.2, it says, in the, third, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the direct destruction of Jerusalem. So when Daniel comes to understand the 70 years, he understood it not simply on the book of Jeremiah, right? He says he understood by books. There has to be at least one other book that he was referencing because he understood by books the numbers of years spoken of by Jeremiah the prophet, right? So if you go to verse 11, he, he gives us a pretty clear indication of what that other book was. He says, Yea, all Israel hath transgressed thy law even by departing that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. There's a curse poured upon us in agreement, with, in agreement with Jeremiah's 70 years, and Ezra in 2 Chronicles 36, 21 connects the 70 years with the curse of Leviticus 26. So it's a pretty good hunch that Daniel's going to connect it with Leviticus 26 as well, because 
God is not the author of the confusion. The spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. So Daniel's going to be teaching the same thing that Ezra is teaching in 2 Chronicles and Jeremiah is teaching in 25.12. The curse is poured upon us and the oath. The oath, that's the same word that's translated as weak in verse 27 of Daniel 9. It's the same word that's translated four times in Leviticus 26 as seven times. It's the same word that's translated in Leviticus 25 verse 8 four times as seven. And it's the same word that's translated twice in verses 1 through 7 of Leviticus 25 as seventh. All right? The oath. So, in Daniel 9.11... Daniel 9.11, it says, Yea, all Israel had transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, which we, ha which we have sinned against him. So what's the other book that Daniel came to understand the 70 years with? The book of Moses, but it's the part of the book of Moses where the oath is marked, and the oath, that Hebrew word, is the feminine passive participle of this very same word. In Daniel 9.27, it's just a passive participle of this word that it's translated as seventh or seven times or seven or weak. Here it's the passive participle. And it's correct. Daniel's saying, I realize the 25.20 has already begun. This oath of God, it's already started in the past tense. So he's there being correct to the grammar as well. Okay. Back to your notes on page 22. Our only bottom of the page from manuscript releases number 760, manuscript release number 760, our only safety is, is, walking, is in walking circumspectly before God. Perilous times are before us. We are to make every effort to stand in the counsel of God and not in our own wisdom. Let the simple doctrines of the word shine forth in their true bearing and let them be urged home according to their relative importance. What's relative mean? Let them be urged home according to their relative importance. Context. Context. Connection? Would connection? Have we been trying to make a, a, a connection between the 2300 and the 2520? Their relative importance? Let us teach only the truths of heavenly origin. Things new and old are connected through the Holy Spirit's guidance when the truth is taught as it is in Jesus without obscurity, without compromise, without fear, without losing sight of the cross as what? The great center of all truth. The cross is the great center of all truth. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, when he came to confirm the covenant with many for one week, when he came to confirm the covenant for 2,520 days, the center of this truth is the cross. Amen. What does she say about this chart? Oh that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, and what? It should not be altered. It was directed by the hand of the Lord. Um, what? I won't go there. This column here, is the column of what? The 2520, brothers and sisters. It'd be this column, all these columns, if you haven't wrapped your minds around them, they're teaching lessons both this way and this way on this chart. And I'm sure that there was human beings that de determined to accomplish that work purposely, but I'm, I'm certain that there's things that were accomplished in the production of both these charts that were outside human understanding. Amen. The more you look at these charts, the more amazing they are, the way they're structured. But when it comes to the 2520, this, here, this is the column of the 2520. It begins in 677, and they thought it ended in 1843. But what's the center of the 2520 on this chart? The cross. The 2520 is this week. It's derived from Leviticus 26. And what's the center of this week? The cross. What's the center of all doctrines? The cross. Because there was, the Lord held his hand over a mistake in some of the figures on this chart, but they corrected it on this chart. So this column here, 
This is the column of the 2520. If you could see up there, the small print, it begins in 677, and now it's corrected. It goes to 1844. What's the center of this column? The cross. The cross is the center of the 2520. And the 2520 is, a, is the passage that Daniel uses, or the Holy Spirit uses, to illustrate the week that Christ confirms the covenant in the 2300-year prophecy. You follow me? So the 49 years comes from Leviticus 25 and 26. The 490 years comes from Leviticus 25 and 26. The one week comes from Leviticus 25 and 26. And you can't restore the sanctuary at the end of the 2300 days if the host isn't restored at the same time at the end of the 2520. So if you're going to throw out the 2520, you're destroying the central pillar and foundation of Adventism. I didn't follow the first part of your comment. Okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through all these notes, but I'm going to go through some of them. What I'm saying now, we're coming to a conclusion. I'm going to turn to page 23 of your notes. Um, how did we portray that today? He said the 49 years began in 457, which is the third decree, and is typifying 1844, which is the third message, correct? That's what we said, whether you believe it or not, right? And what we said about the 49 years is that it's identifying the work that God's people have to accomplish, correct? And that this 49 year period that was actually accomplished in the 2300 years is symbolically fulfilled at the end of the world because all the prophets are speaking more about the end of the world than the days in which they lived. And that this 49 years of the 2300 years is illustrated by the 49 years of the Jubilee cycle. And it leads to the 50th year, which is the Jubilee. And it's witnessed to by the deliverance of Egypt, which is from Passover to Pentecost. 49 days, then the 50th being Pentecost. Do you remember all that? So we marked that at the end of the 49 years, in 408, that this was typifying the end of our work, right? but that it only took how many days to actually rebuild the street and walls? 52 days. So the work that we do in Adventism from 1844, we don't do it for a very long time. But just before the Lord returns, in 52 symbolic days, we're going to take up the work that the Lord has given us. And the work that the Lord has given us to do is to what? Restore the streets. What's the streets? The, the street. The old path. So I'm suggesting that the 408 is the Sunday law, that this 49 years leads to the Sunday law, because the Sunday law is paralleling Pentecost, is it not? Does Sister White not say that often? And that at the Sunday law is where he's going to enter into covenant with those that have the seal of God. And that after the streets and walls were built in Nehemiah, there was a sealing process, a numbering of the people. They came together in unity, which was accomplished at Pentecost with the disciples and accomplished with Moses and the 70 elders at the first Pentecost. Remember all that? So I'm placing 
the end of this work, at the end of the world, it goes until the Sunday law where the Lord's sealing those in Adventism that receive the seal of God in contrast with those in Adventism that receive the mark of the beast. But I'm saying that this sealing is the Sunday law and it ends a very short period. I don't know how to illustrate this. I'm not so sure it's 408. It ends the short period of the 52, that's represented by the 52 days, but the 52 days begins when the troublous times begin. So the troublous times begin. How to illustrate this? This isn't big enough, that's why I'm hesitating. On 9-11. Okay, follow the logic there? Yes, no? Okay. Then we looked at 490 years, which begins in 457, 1844. It's emphasizing the probationary Are probationary time for Adventism, right? 490 years probationary time. That ends, that ends when? With the stoning of Stephen. But we're, we're saying that in the stoning of Stephen, in AD 34, that this is actually the Sunday law. Because in AD 34, God in His mercy extended the time so that those who had not known the truth, the children of the Jews, had opportunity to understand the message presented by the disciples until Jerusalem is destroyed in Daniel 12.1. Follow the logic? So our probationary time ends right here at the Sunday law. Okay, so then we looked at the 2300 years that begins in 457, but we're going to start at when? 1844. And this is talking about the establishment of the host and the establishment of the sanctuary in terms of, and when does this take place? Did you follow that one? Okay, if, if it's at the Sunday Law, if this is the Sunday Law, what has he done at the Sunday Law in terms of Malachi 3? He's purified the sons of Levi. He's made the sons of Levi ready. But in order to purify the sons of Levi for the Sunday law, this is the Sunday law, this is number 50. Are you following this? Okay, because I mean, I know that some of you aren't following this, and I know that some of you are. And for those of you that are following it, it's kind of scary that you're following it, huh? <laughs> because if you, can, if you can follow it, it's really not that... It's not, it's not that hard. But if it's new, I admit, it, it's, uh, it's difficult to hold all these things in place. But for those of you that are following it, it's pretty profound and it's pretty simple. You know, you're just taking that history and you're bringing it down to the end of the world and you're letting the Bible define what those histories represent and placing them at the end of the world. And it's not really any human reasoning, it's just pulling these things together, right? So in this history of the 2300 days, we read a quote where Sister White says that the same event was fulfilled on October 22, 1844 as Daniel 7.13, Daniel 8.14, Malachi 3, and the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled on 1840, in 1844, October 22. So this history about developing the host, it includes the history of the parable of the ten virgins and the purifying of the sons of Levi. And when does that take place? It takes place, if you remember, when the Lord suddenly comes to His temple. And because that is premised upon Malachi 3, it's talking about the history of Christ when 
John the Baptist prepares the way for Christ to suddenly come to the holy place. It's talking about the history of the Millerites. Um, When William Miller prepares for Christ to suddenly come to the most holy place, and it's talking about the end of the world, when Christ suddenly comes to what? The judgment of the living. For what purpose? To purify the sons of Levi. And who are the sons of Levi? Those that are going to stand faithful in the image of the beast test. So this history includes the development here. This would be 1844 if you were to begin in 457. But we're beginning it here and applying it at the end of the world. This history, it's marking also when the Lord suddenly comes to his temple and begins the judgment of the living and the blotting out of sin. It includes 9-11. Okay, so we have one other history to put in here. And this is pretty, this is the easiest, I think this is the easiest one to see. This is the one where Christ comes to confirm the covenant. Let's call this the covenant prophecy. And when Christ comes to confirm the covenant with many for one week, what begins that week? The baptism. AD 27, isn't it? And is there a divine symbol that comes down out of heaven at the baptism? The dove. What's the dove prefigured by? It's symbolizing the Holy Spirit, but what's it prefigured by? Who prefigured Christ? No, John the Baptist prepared the way for Christ, but who typified Christ? Moses. So, when did the divine symbol come down in the story of Moses? When he was on his way back to Egypt, and the Lord came down and confronted him with what? The test of circumcision. And the rite of circumcision was replaced in the Christian church with what? Baptism. So this is the Lord coming down to Moses. This is the dove coming down to Jesus. And those two histories are pointing forward to what? August 11th, 1840. A mighty angel came down. Why did the angel come down? See, they had set up that the next presentation was going to be question and answers, where you can ask questions and maybe we'll have some answers. You didn't know that this presentation was going to be questions and answers, did you? Only I'm going to ask the questions. All right. Here, what brings the angel of Revelation 10 down? Pardon me? Islam's close, but what about Islam? The restraint of Islam marks this history. The restraint of Islam brings the angel down for the Millerite history. What brings the angel of Revelation 18 down? Okay, how how can, why is that so? Why why do we have the the prophetic authority to say because the angel of Revelation 10, 10 came down because the Islam was restrained in the Millerite history, and therefore when Islam is restrained in our history, that's when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down. What prophetic right do we have to say that? Millerite, Millerite history is repeated, okay, but you, you can only prove something with the testimony of two or three. I'll, I'll grant you, we've already shown here today that Millerite history is repeated. That's one. Where's another testimony? Alpha and Omega. What's the Alpha and Omega? Christ is the Alpha and Omega, but what's the principle of Alpha and Omega? The beginning and end. The beginning of Adventism is going to illustrate the end of Adventism. Therefore, what brought the angel down in the beginning of Adventism was the restraint of Islam. What brings him down at the end of Adventism is the restraint of Islam. If you don't believe that, you don't believe the Alpha and Omega. Who's the Alpha and Omega? Whoa. Is Christ in this message? He's the Alpha and the Omega. 
Okay, so we're saying that here, this is 9-11. And what's he doing? Do you, if I lost you? What's he doing here? He's confirming his covenant with many for one week. What's the midst of the week? The cross. Okay, where do we put the cross? So let's go to the end of the week. What's the end of the week? It's uh, the stoning of Stephen. When's that? And what's the stoning of Stephen typifying? Daniel 12, 1. Michael stands up. Did Michael stand up when Stephen was stoned? Yes. yes. And this brought what? The destruction of Jerusalem, although it was prolonged. That brought the destruction of Jerusalem, did it not? Michael stands up. You have the seven last plagues, which is typified by the destruction of Jerusalem. This is the week. What's in the midst of the week? Where's the cross? The Sunday law is the cross. Is it not? What happens at the Sunday law? What happens at the Sunday law? What happened in the temple? Okay, and the, the ripping of the veil in the temple signifies what? That the door of that intercession is closed. But what prefigures the, the cross? What prefigures the cross? Think of it in terms of the Alpha and Omega. The cross is the Omega. What's the Alpha? The cross is the Omega of ancient Israel histories. What's the Alpha of ancient Israel's history? Passover. Passover. And what were they to do at Passover? Slay the lamb, close the door, and put the blood on the doorpost, right? Correct? So at the cross... We got a closing of the door. Where's the door closed for Adventists? Sunday law. Sunday law. He's confirming the covenant with many for one week, and the confirmation of the covenant begins at 9 11. The Sunday law is the third test for Adventism. The first test begins on 9 11, and the second test comes in the middle. Comes in the middle of the, the first and third. The third test, the door closes. That's the Sunday law. That's the cross. What follows the cross? In the prophetic a disappointment. What's the disappointment? The disappointment, brothers and sisters, is that everyone in this room today may thoroughly believe that they're going to stand faithful at the Sunday Law and that your wife's going to be standing there with you or your husband or your daughter or your son or your dad and your mom and at the Sunday Law we're going to realize that the people that we thought were going to be standing there are not standing there. And we're going to realize that instead of standing there they're going to be going to the courts and to the police and be the ones turning us in. Is that not a Sunday Law that's marked in inspiration or a, a disappointment that's marked in inspiration? So, what, what am I saying? What is my point here? That the week that he's confirming the covenant in the 2300 days, it has a specific application to our day and age. Now go to your notes. We'll try to close this off. Uh, in the top of page 23, you'll see Matthew 3, 13 to 17, which is, let me just look at it to make sure that I have made all the points out of there that probably should be made. It's the baptism of Christ. And in verse 1 of chapter 4, he goes into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. How many times is he tempted? What's his first temptation? What is it? I'm going to say it 
it's food. I know appetite is a better, a, a better term, but food. What's the second temptation? It's what we, we typically, we would call it presumption, right? He's, he's tempted to take the Word of God and use it in an, in an incorrect application. Cast your, yourself down and the angels will lift you up. What's the third? Worship. Okay, worship the God of this world. Is, is the Sunday law a test of worship? Okay, so this is worship. This is food. Is presumption okay here? Well, what is it? What is it? If I set my human judgment above, above, above the Word of God, is that presumption? Yes. And what causes me, what spirit causes me to do that? Self-exaltation, right? Gadol. Lifting me, myself up. So, so maybe, how many of you understand what Gadol is? Raise your hand if you understand. Some, in, this, in this message, sometimes we refer to Gadol and everyone seems to know, but in reality, probably the majority of the people in the audience don't understand what Gadol is. You don't understand what Gadol is. Okay, go to Daniel chapter 8. Go, go to Daniel chapter 8 and put your finger in there and then go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verse 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will set also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the, the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. The root principle of Satan's religion is self-exaltation, lifting yourself up, the lifting up. That is the root of Satan's religion. And what is Satan's religion? It's spiritualism. Spiritualism is Satan's religion. And spiritualism is placing your word above God's word. You know, believe it, but it is. We think it's witchcraft and magic and celebration and hypnosis. But the bottom line is if you're going to place your word above God's word, you're repeating the self-exaltation of Lucifer, and it is spiritualism. It's presumption. It's the second test. Okay, so the root, root of Lucifer's religion is self-exaltation. So go to Daniel 8 now. When did we start this? 43 minutes ago. All right. Notice in Daniel 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, after that which appeared unto me at the first. What does that mean? It means... It's a second vision. Okay, this vision is part two of a vision. Where's part one of this two-part vision? Go to chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had dreams and visions on his bed, of his head upon his bed, then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. So in the first year of Belshazzar, he has a vision. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, two years later, in the third year of Belshazzar, he has a vision. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. Whether he's saying 
after the first vision or after the first year of Belshazzar, it doesn't matter. It's the same vision. So what Daniel has just done, he's tied together Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, saying to a student of prophecy, you need to understand both of these chapters as one prophecy, repeat and enlarge. But Daniel's purposely tied them together. Do you see that? He didn't have to put verse 1 in there of chapter 8, but he did. He says, this came after that one. Therefore, study them together. And what's Daniel chapter 7? We're running out of time, so we've got to just move through this question and answer period. What's Daniel chapter 7? Very simple answer. It's the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. How are the kingdoms of Bible prophecy illustrated in Daniel chapter 7? They're beasts. And what does the beast represent in Bible prophecy? Kingdoms. Political kingdoms, not just kingdoms. So the first vision is of Daniel 7 is the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, but it is their political manifestation. But Daniel chapter 8, working upon the principle of repeat and enlarge, is the same vision, only this isn't the political manifestation of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, is it? It's the religious manifestation of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. How do we know that? How are the kingdoms in Daniel chapter 8 illustrated? With sanctuary animals, the ram, the goat, the imperfect point comes next. They are illustrated with sanctuary animals and sanctuary terms because Daniel wants us to understand that Daniel chapter 8 is the kingdoms of Bible prophecies, religious, not political manifestation. Because in Isaiah 14, what did Lucifer want to do? He wanted to see, seat himself upon God's throne. And where else? On the sides of the north. He wants to be the king of God's political kingdom and the king of God's religious kingdom. And Daniel 7 is talking about the political kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And Daniel 8 is speaking about the religious manifestation of these very same kingdoms. Therefore, Daniel illustrates these kingdoms with sanctuary animals and sanctuary terms. Now the point that the brethren in the back rows are making, correctly, is that every one of these sanctuary animals and terms is unacceptable in the sanctuary. Okay, <laughs> you look at them. Look at uh, verse 3. A ram is a sanctuary animal. In verse 3 of Daniel, it says, Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, and he had two horns, and the two horns was high, but one was higher than another. Did a, a sanctuary animal have to be perfect? Yes. This animal isn't perfect. What about the goat? One of his horns broken and four horns come out of it. Is that perfect? See, every, every kingdom that is illustrated here, especially the kingdom of Rome, the kingdom of Rome in, in verse 9 through 12 is illustrated as what? The little horn. The little horn, that's a sanctuary term, isn't it? I mean, isn't there horns on the corners of the altar? Okay, but what's wrong with this little horn in verses 9 through 12? What's wrong with it? Because there's something wrong with it. <laughs> verse 9, it's masculine. In verse 10, it's feminine. In verse 11, it's masculine. And in verse 12, it's feminine. What does the Bible say about a cross-dressing person? A man that dresses like a woman. You think that's acceptable in the sanctuary? No. no. Brothers and sisters, this little horn, it can't be true religion. Daniel's representing the kingdoms of Bible prophecy in their religious manifestation, and he uses sanctuary terms to do so, but the sanctuary terms are always corrupt, saying that this is a corrupt religion. That's why when these men say that the daily in Daniel 8 represents Christ's sanctuary ministry, Brothers and sisters, the word to me that's translated as daily occurs 105 times in God's word, but it's always different in the book of Daniel. Everywhere it occurs, it's a, a, an adjective or an adverb, except in the book of Daniel where it's a noun. It's different. It's turned upside down. Can't be the sanctuary term because it's not correct. It's a noun. This is such a profound change that when the, the translators of the King James Bible translated to meet in the book of Daniel where it occurs, 
They knew it was supposed to be an adverb or an adjective, and they knew it was a noun, so they determined to stick the word sacrifice with it to turn it back into an adjective or an adverb, and that's the only added word in God's Word that Ellen White says was added by human wisdom and does not belong to the text because it's supposed to be a noun. Okay, it's a sanctuary term, the continual burnt offering. To me, it means continual, but it's incorrect, it's a noun. It's turned upside down. Just like the, the ram and the goat with their broken and uh, in unequal horns. Okay, so when you're going to say that daily in Daniel 8 represents Christ, that's saying that it is a corrupt term. That you're using a corrupt term to represent Christ. So in this story, in Daniel chapter 8, this is about the religion of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And the theme that runs through it from beginning to end is Gadol. All right. Notice in verse 4. Medes and Persians. The ram. In the last phrase says, But the Medes and Persians, the ram, he did according to his will and he became great. This Hebrew word that is translated as great means gadol. It means self-exaltation. This is Satan's religion. The religion represented by the Medes and Persians by the ram, it's gadol. It's spiritualism. It's self-exaltation. But the next kingdom is the goat of Rome. And in verse 8, it says of Greece, the goat of Greece. I stand corrected, Greece. Okay, in verse 8, it says, Therefore the he-goat waxed what? Very great. Okay, his gadol, his self-exaltation, is going to exceed the self-exaltation of the Medes and the Persians. And in verse 9, the little horn of Rome, it waxed exceedingly great. Self-exaltation. And in verse 10, the little horn of the papacy waxed great. It's an escalation of self-exaltation. It increases. You combine that with Daniel 2, and you see a progression. Daniel 2 demonstrates a progression. There's a progression here. So what I'm saying is, the religion of these kingdoms of Bible prophecy is the religion of self-exaltation. It's spiritualism. It's paganism. It's Satan's religion. And the symbol of this religion is the daily paganism that needs to be taken away. And it's taken away right at the foot of the cross on both these charts. So when we come to the three tests of Christ, one of the things that we can glean from these three tests is the first one has to do with eating, appetite. The second, presumption, putting your word above the word of God. This is self-exaltation. The third one, worship, has to do with whether you're going to worship the beast or you're going to stand with the Levites and oppose the worship of the beast. In, I want, to, I want to put one thing into the mix. Go to verse 26. <clears throat> How many times did Christ cleanse the temple? Twice. How many times was the temple cleansed in the Millerite history? Twice. How many temple cleansings are there at the end of the world? Two. We should understand that. We don't, but we should. Um, so in Matthew 23, 38, when Christ first cleansed the temple, here's what he said. It's in your notes on the top of page 26. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. First temple cleansing. And on the first temple cleansing, you can lay right over top the second temple cleansing. They're parallel lines of prophecy. And what did he say after he cleansed the temple the second time. No, I, 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 I'm sorry. The first time was what? I got him backwards. Long day. The first time he cleansed the temple, what did he say? My apologies. 
you've made my father's house a den of thieves. And the last time he said, your, your house is left desolate. So the cleansing of the temple has to do with the, the setting aside of ancient Israel. So go now to page 26. Right before the triumphal entry, what did Christ do? What's the triumphal entry prefigure in the Millerite history? What, what history does Sister White use the triumphal entry to illustrate in the Millerite history? We're almost done with question and answer, so bear with me. When Sister White illustrates the midnight cry of the Millerite history, what history does she use to illustrate that? The triumphal entry. Okay, now let, let's put this in place. This is the Millerite history, and we're saying the Millerite history, it began with the angel coming down in Revelation 10, right? And there's two temple cleansings in this history also. The one here with the activity of the Protestants of the United States, which is the Sunday Law. And the other, when judgment begins. That's Millerite history. August 11th, 1840, Islam is restrained. The mighty angel of Revelation 10 comes down. The first angel's message is in power. The Protestants of the United States are tested. In June of 1842, the Protestants close their door. Then comes the first disappointment. Then comes the midnight cry right here. That's the triumphal entry, according to Sister White. Correct? And it leads to the cross. It leads to the disappointment of the disciples immediately after the cross, which prefigures the disappointment of the Millerites immediately after October 22, 1844. On October 22nd, 1844, the second door is closed in this history. This is the closing of the door on the Millerites. The first door closed when the Protestant closed their churches in June of 1842. That's the first temple cleansing. So when you take the two temple cleansings in the time of Christ and you lay them over one another, what precedes the triumphal entry? Pardon me? Go to Matthew 21, 2 in your notes. Saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. What introduces the triumphal entry? Islam is restrained to bring on the triumphal entry. Is Islam an ass in Bible prophecy? Okay, the restraint of Islam precedes the triumphal entry. And there you have a quote under the triumphal entry where she compares that with the midnight cry. Okay, then the cross, then Daniel 12.1. Okay, all right. I have enough information there to bring this to a conclusion. I've put it in place. Let me summarize this for you. Give me five minutes, and we can go into our question and answer period where it's reversed. If we want to. In the week of Daniel 9.27, that week is the same Hebrew word that's translated as seven times in Leviticus 26. But Leviticus 26 is speaking about the quarrel of his covenant. And the week in Daniel 9.27 is where he confirms his covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week is the cross. The beginning of the week is when the divine symbol comes down. In this week, uh, we have illustrated the close of probation at the stoning of Stephen. Therefore, this week is paralleling our history when the divine symbol comes down on 9-11 with the restraint of Islam. When the dove comes down, it begins a threefold testing process. Let me. A threefold testing process that begins with the call to eat the little book. And if we refuse to eat the little book, we begin to place our word above God's word, thus developing 
not the image of Christ, but the image of the beast, because what are we told even as human beings? You are what you eat. If you refuse to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ, then all you can eat is the flesh and blood of the beast. You're developing the image of the beast. And you will manifest that character right here at the Sunday Law when you either get the mark of the beast or the seal of God. You will demonstrate who you're going to worship, paralleling Christ. This history here, this week, it begins with what test from ancient Israel? Don't let that horn distract you. Okay. What test marks the beginning of this history? 9 11. But what test biblically? Yeah, back further. This is Numbers 14.34, the year-day principle. The test of the rest of grace. It's Jeremiah 6.16, the old paths. Right? You, you, you learned that this, this Sabbath day, didn't you? And what's the symbol of that rest that gets rejected by some in Adventism at this time? That's a 25.20. In between here and the Sunday Law, and what's, what's the history of ancient Israel that represents the Sunday Law? It's Ezekiel 4, 6, the year-day principle. What was the rebellion against in that history? It's the Sunday Law. And, and what's, what's the... Probation closing. This is the close of probation. Jerusalem's destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. How old are you? 15. How come a 15 year old can get this? And us old guys can't get it. All right. This is the close of probation. What's the test in the middle? The daily. The daily? It's Gadol. It's self-exaltation. Okay, it's, it's spiritualism. It's turning things upside down, brothers and sisters. It's Isaiah 29, where Isaiah condemns those who can't understand this, the book that is sealed because they've turned things upside down, and what gets turned upside down is the understanding of the daily. For the pioneers understood the daily was paganism, but now we teach that it's Christ's sanctuary ministry. That's not a minor disagreement. It's 180 degrees different. What does it mean when you assign the work of Christ to the devil or the work of the devil to Christ? Yeah. It's abomination, but it's the unpardonable sin. Mm. Okay, so we're repeating those histories. And what about, what about when, who was it? Caiaphas? Was it Caiaphas? I think it was Caiaphas. They gave a, a, a satanic statement, but it was a prophecy. He says it's expedient that one mind die, that the whole nation perish not. Okay, that was satanic, right? To say that Christ should die. That's satanic. But it was a prophecy, was it not? Okay. Brothers and sisters, once again, these are the three tests that are marked in your Newport letter. These are the three doctrines that they reject. The 2520, the daily, and the close of probation. And along with those three doctrines, point number four is church authority. This is a three-one combination. The fourth angel's message is where the power comes. This is a counterfeit 3-1 combination, and their power is human dependence. Yes, and Sister White, speaking of the Omega apostasy, says they built their structure upon human power. And storm and tempest sweeps the structure away. Amen. So you, in Newport, and you know the story of Newport. I wasn't going to tell this story because everyone here knows this story, but I'll tell this story. Okay. 
In this history here. In this history here, this is about probationary time. And this is Joel also, right? This is 490 years representing probationary time. Not really 490 years, literally. The 490 years of the 2300 years is demonstrating the history of Adventism from 1844 until the Sunday law when probation closes. You follow that? But in Joel, we're told that it represents how many generations? Four generations. When do the generations begin and end? Okay, well, the first generation, I would submit, goes from 1844 to 1888. And the second one goes from? 1888. Uh, 1919, I would say. Uh, who knows? And the third goes from 1919 to when? 1989 is the fourth generation. This is the generation of vipers we're living in now. Okay, let me explain why. In 1843, or 1883, Uriah Smith began to teach and print that Sister White was only inspired when she received a vision. But when she gave testimonies to people, they were not inspired. In 1884, the next year, the General Conference President, George Butler, put a series of ten articles out where he said that the Bible has degrees of inspiration. And by the conclusion of those ten articles, he listed what portions of the Bible were not inspired. So leading up to the 1888 General Conference, we had the leader of the publishing work and the leader of the general conference reject both the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And Sister White was not silent. She commented on these things. And when you get to 1888, it wasn't just the leaders, the men that were gathered in convocation in 1888 rejected both the authority of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Historical fact. If you haven't read that, if you haven't come to understand that, shame on you. This isn't my opinion, it's a historical fact, but it can be demonstrated. 1884 brings you to the point where they've, they've taken a public position rejecting the authority of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And in December of 1844, Ellen White received her first open vision in Portland, Maine. And in 1884, she received her last open vision 40 years later. And she plainly teaches that the visions become less and less because they're not believed in. And when you read about her first vision, she says there were five women there with her and they all believed in the visions. So 40 years later, the visions end. And where was it that she had her last open vision? In Portland, Oregon. From the port on the east coast to the port on the west coast. The open visions. And as lightning shineth from where? The west unto the east. Ah, the direction of inspiration is from the east to the west. From Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon. This first generation. But Sister White talks about Portland, Rhode Island. Is the place where the Sabbath in Adventism traces its roots. There were pilgrims that came from England and settled in, not Portland. Newport, Newport Rhode Island. Okay. And... They thought, these Sabbath-keeping pilgrims thought that they conti could continue to worship with Sunday-keeping pilgrims, but they realized shortly thereafter that it's impossible to be a Sabbath-keeper who also believes in the Antichrist, because Sister White noted that they also believed, these Sabbath-keeping pilgrims, that the Pope of Rome was the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. They had not then assigned that teaching to the historical trash heap. They realized they could not worship together with the Sunday-keeping pilgrims, and there was a separation. And Sister White says these Sabbath-keeping pilgrims is the, the point of reference that the Sabbath truth comes to Adventism. It comes to Adventism in Newport, Rhode Island. Now in this town, in Newport, Washington, there's now a controversy over the foundational message. And there's a forced separation going on between one class that's preparing to worship on Sunday 
and one class that's preparing to stand up for the Sabbath in the very near future. From Portland to Portland, from Newport to Newport, port, 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 port. <laughs> east to west. So brothers and sisters, these four generations, these four generations bring us to this generation when all the components of the 2300 years are illustrating what goes on here at the end but the 2300 year prophecy is based upon the 2520 prophecy. You follow me? And the argument, the rejection of the rest of Jeremiah 6 is the rejection of the 2520. And as they're rejecting the 2520, they do not understand that they are rejecting the central pillar and foundation of Adventism. Scary times. So we just move right into questions and answers or we take a break? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this may appear to be a very complex message and this is a fairly recent recognition so there's still corners that need to be rounded off and things that have been missed recognized and there's some in this audience that are unfamiliar with the prophetic applications of these truths so we we recognize that but in spite of all this, we recognize that you are bringing into clarity the shaking, the testing, the controversy of the call to return to the old paths and what the implications of this debate, as Isaiah says, is. We wish to be among those that rightly understand these truths that you are leading us with, but also that rightly have the experience of the Mare, where we have an experience that can convey this message in the most winning possible way. We do not want to be critical of those that are fighting against this message in terms of judging their motivations for all we can see is sorrow and sadness when we see the direction that they're going. But in spite of that, we must be specific about what is happening. We have actually reached the time where you are shaking your people in, in advance of the Sunday law, strengthening your people in advance of the Sunday law, binding your people off. And this is a terrible ordeal. The church appears to fall at this time, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion are removed. Heavenly Father, we wish to be among those that remain. We want to stand upon the rock no matter what storm and tempest comes our way, and we ask that you would help us to do this, that you'd give us the spiritual discernment to rightly divide your word. I ask that you'd bless those that fulfill their responsibilities as Bereans and go home and test these things that they've heard, whether they understood them fully or not. Bless them to have the discernment necessarily, necessary to come to the correct understanding of these things. I pray for this community where the shaking is very intense and the outlying areas and all of your Advent people as it's this, this controversy, this crisis is on its way to sweep around planet Earth throughout Adventism. Pray that those that wish to stand upon the rock will have the courage and fortitude to do so and that some of those that have stepped off the platform would return in fulfillment of the prediction by Sister White. We thank you for allowing us to go through these things on this Sabbath day. Uh, we thank you that you've blessed our fellowship, our pressing together here. And we ask for your continued presence in this follow-up meeting. Questions and answers in Jesus' name. Amen.